This webinar is going to be on the light of Hanukkah. That's what the subject is. So we know that the Midrash in Bereshis 2.4 tells us that the Greek exile was called darkness. Out of all the exiles, it was the darkest one of all of them. Now, why is that true? That is because they didn't believe in anything beyond the senses. So there's two types of darkness. There's a darkness that is beyond the senses. That's what we're going to talk about first. The Ramban brings down a Vayikra. He says like this, But we felt it necessary to seal the mouths of scholars of the nature who are drawn after the Greek philosopher Aristotle, who are we talking about, who denied the validity of everything except that which is tangible to him, and who arrogantly thought and his evil students that any concept which you cannot figure out logically is not true. The Greeks believed in only in sense perception. If you could see it, then it existed. If you can't see it, it doesn't exist. And that is against the Torah. And that's why the Greeks were against the Torah. Like it says, the Rambam in the Halachas of Hanukkah, chapter 3, Halacha 1, says, in the era of the Second Temple, the Greek kingdom issued decrees against the Jewish people, attempted to nullify their faith and refusing them to allow to observe the Torah and the commandments. The Greeks came against us because they didn't believe in anything beyond sense perception. And the entire Torah, and the entire Torah, but many parts of the Torah are based on things that we can't see. For example, the Maharal explains that the next world, which the Jews believe in, many people ask me many times, a lot of people ask me, do the Jews believe in the next world? It's kind of a silly question to me, but to them it's a real question. And so of course we believe in the next world. So why is it not written in the Torah? Why is the next world not written in the Torah? That's because the next world is so far beyond our comprehension that it's not applicable to write it inside the Torah. There's no point in writing it in the Torah because we want to understand what it meant. So therefore, and the Greeks did not believe in anything beyond sense perception. And that's why they wanted to come against us. They did not want to uh, have the Torah around because it went against what they believed. So that's one type of darkness. But there's another type of darkness, and that's the darkness beyond consciousness. For example, Rav Dessler says, the deeper aspects of ourselves can only be approached indirectly. We cannot get into our subconscious. We cannot get into our kishkas. We can try and we can work on ourselves. Obviously, over time, little by little, we start to reveal who we really are to ourselves. But really, we don't have access, direct access to the subconscious. And he brings down Rav Yusuf Salanter, who brings that unbelievable example. You have a teacher, a rabbi, who has a student and a son. The student is an unbelievable student. Maybe he's going to be the next guy to adore. And the son is not doing so well. But in the middle of the night, they say there's a fire in the dormitories. And they wake up the Rebbe. And the Rebbe says, please save my son. That's his reaction. That's his gut reaction. Why? Because even though he loves his student, in theory, more than his son, because he knows his student's going to be the next guy to adore, his student's going to be unbelievable, and his son's not going to be anybody. But still, in his subconscious, he well, loves his son. So he's going to react with the subconscious. We, we react with our subconscious. That's who we really are. But in order to do tshuva shlema, in order for a person to really come back to God, he has to go all the way down into his subconscious. He has to be completely and absolutely conscious in order to really become a pure person and to, be, to become a better person. So this is what it says in the Gemara. And this is what Dessler brings. He says, it would have been more pleasant for a person not been created. There's a Machlokis, Beis Hillel, and Beis Shammai, whether man should have not been created. Maybe he should have been created, maybe not. Why not? Because he's not going to be successful. 95% of the people in the world are not successful. They're not Siddiquim, Gedolia Torah, great in Torah. They're not scholars. They're regular people. They weren't successful at the level that the Torah demands them to be successful. So therefore, in theory, you would think maybe it's better not to create people. They're just going to fail. What does the Gemara say? 
But now that they've been created, let him search his past deeds, discover what his sins are, and let him examine his deeds. Let him check himself. Okay, we've been created. Here we are. God created us in his chesed, and here we are. Thank God we're here. So let us at least do a cheshbon and nefesh. Let us at least check out what we're doing with our lives, what we did with our lives, and what we did yesterday, and what we're going to do tomorrow, and think about these things in order to be successful. There's only two problems, which we mentioned. One thing is the darkness of the senses. Well, where is God? And where is Allah Ba? And where is spirituality? And where is my soul? Where are these things? I can't see them. And not only that, there's the darkness of our subconscious. I don't even know what I'm really feeling when I, when I have a 40-inch slip. So you can have a 40-inch slip, and all of a sudden something comes out. You don't even know where it came from. So you're wondering where that came from. You don't even know yourself. So there's two types of darkness that prevents us from being successful. So how is it going to help for us to examine our deeds in order to be successful if the world is dark to us? Everything outside of our consciousness is not available. So it says like this. The Zohar says that there are two types of light. There's Mureya Eish and Mureya Or. The light of fire and the light of lights. And the Zohar wants to use this to answer the original Kasha in the Gemara that it says that there was two lights that were created. So simple Peshat is the sun and the moon. But really, it, he, the Zohar is saying, no, it was these two lights. The Mureya Eish and the Mureya Or. And the Mureya Or, it's what's known as the Or Aganus. The Or Aganus means the light that was hidden away from the Siddiqui. And the Mureya Eish is light as we know it. It's a fire that burns, but it consumes. And the difference between the two is the Morea age has light, but it has to consume something. So it has a negative, dark side to it. But the Morea ore is pure light. Gemara says like this. Gemara Chagiga. It says, regarding the, the light that the Holy One blessed would be created on the first day, man could use it to see everything from one end of the world to the other. We know that Adam Rishon was able to see from one end of the world to the other. How? Because he had this light. He had the Oregon news, the hidden light. But what happened? The Holy One, blessed be he, looked at the generation of the flood, the generation of the dispersion, and he saw that their deeds were perverse. And therefore he hit. The light was withheld from the wicked. And what did he do with this light? He saved it for the righteous people. In the future, it says, God saw the light was good. What's good? Good's referring to righteous people. Save the righteous people, that he is good. And then once the light saw that it was hidden, so the light itself was happy. Like it says, the light of the righteousness is gladdened. So what is the point? The point is that after the sin of Adam and Rishon, it's actually interesting because you have here Gemara saying it was really based on the future. It was based on, that's why Hashem hid it. But we know that it disappeared. The light was hidden after the sin of Adam and Rishon. 36 hours. Basically, this light was from the time that man was created. He had this light. Adam and Rishon had this light for 36 hours. And then on Moshe Shabbos, it disappeared. And that's what it says. The Sfas brings down. And that Shabbos itself, we know there's a Pasuk in Shabbos telling you not to light the light of fire. That's the Moreya Eish. And that's the one that's articulated. Really, all the dinim of Shabbos, all the laws of Shabbos, are learned from the Malacha and the Mishkan, the building of the base of Migdash. Except for this one. This one was said Meforish in the Torah. Why is that? Because really, Shabbos itself also has the Oregon news. Shabbos has this hidden light. We get a taste of this hidden light on Shabbos. And that's why we're not supposed to use the other light, which is the negative light, the light of fire, the consuming light. We're not supposed to use it. And then when we make Havdal, we say, Berei Moreha Eish. We say, thank you, Hashem, for giving us the consuming light. And that comes back afterwards. But during Shabbos, we get a taste of the next world. What does this have to do with the darkness that we were speaking about? and the lack of consciousness, and the lack of ability to see beyond this world. Well, the Rokeach explains that Hanukkah, the light of Hanukkah, is going to help us to overcome our evil inclination. The 36 candles of the Hanukkah, we light 36 candles on Hanukkah, those 36 candles are the candles of the hidden light. We actually get a taste of the hidden light. And that's why Hanukkah 
can help us to overcome this problem of darkness. Rav Dastu explains, there's eight days of Hanukkah, and we know that eight means beyond. Seven days of the week, eight is already beyond the next world. Eight represents the next world, and that's Hanukkah. Hanukkah has the ability to, to jump us into the next world, to give us the ability to see the next world, to give us the ability to comprehend something beyond our senses, something beyond our consciousness. And not only that, it says in Shmos, in 2531, the menorah itself, the Pasuk said, the verse that tells us, and you shall make a menorah, menorah of pure gold. The menorah shall be hammered, its base, its stem, all the different parts of the menorah. So Rashi explains there, why does it say, and it should be done by itself? The Pasuk says, you shall make a menorah of pure gold. But see some menorah, you know, they, they don't translate it properly. Huh? It says the. It was made by itself, Vasisa Menorah. So Rashi says there, since Moses found it difficult, he couldn't figure out how to do it. The Holy One Blessed be had to say, just throw the gold into the fire, and the menorah came out by itself. That's exactly what happened. The menorah itself comes from beyond this world. Even on the 49th level of being of understanding, Moshe Rabbeinu couldn't understand. He had to, it had to come from beyond. The menorah itself comes from beyond. So that's a similar idea. We see the Hanukkah, which represents the menorah in the base of Migdash. That, that menorah comes from beyond this world, and the light that's coming from it is also coming from beyond this world. So I want to explain a little bit further. It's just like this. Nothing in nature is square. There's no natural phenomenon. There's nothing square. But there is many things that are round. In our world, our world is basically round. The planets are round, the sun is round, the, the, the cycle of the seasons goes round and round. Time is round. We live in a round world. And we don't have anything square. What does this have to do with what I'm talking about? Well, it happens to be, there are certain things that are square in this world. What are they? Mitzvot. A talus is square. And tefillin are square. And a mezuzah is square. So what does it have to do with the tea in China? Well, we know that the world was created with a hay. Our world that we live in, Allah Ba was with the yud, our world is with a hay. Inside of a square. Gemara Menachos 29b says, and why was this world created with a hay? Because the hay represents a place where someone can walk in and walk out. If anyone wishes to leave, he can leave. What does it mean? If he wants to sin, you go ahead. It's a free place. It's a free world. Hashem made the world where anybody can do any sin he wants. That's like going out of the bottom of the hay. Once he goes out of the bottom of the hay, so how does he get back in? Well, there's a little door up on the side of the hay, on the left-hand side there. He can climb back up and go into the world through that door on the left-hand side. That's what it says. What is the reason why the hay is suspended? That if he returns to repentance, it can bring him back through that opening. And therefore, it comes out like this, that our world is inside of a square. And why are those mitzvahs coming, those square mitzvahs coming to tell us, to influence us? To influence has influence from outside of our world, from outside of our senses, from outside of our consciousness. Sitsits, square sitsits, square tefillin, square mezuzah. And the mezuzah goes on a square door. At a mezuzah, you have to have a mashkev. You have to have on top a mashkev. There has to be a square door. Those things that are square, they are going to influence. They're going to be an influence from the outside. And here's an example of what I'm talking about. The world of Chochmah. The world of Chochmah is square. We are caught in a circle, in the circle of our senses, in the circle of our consciousness, in the circle of time. We are caught in, the, in our globe, in our own world. But outside the circle, there's a square. What square? The square of Chochmah. The square of wisdom. 
The Torah, rule, square is also means din, judgment. The laws, the laws of reality, the laws of, of, of science, of physics, the, 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 the reality outside of our world is a square. And not only that, look at this. So the Evan Ezra said that the symbol on the Kohen's garment was exactly that. I'm not sure if he was talking about the Kohen Gadol or the regular Kohen, but on the garments of the Kohenim, the symbol was a circle inside a square. And this is the Jewish concept. The concept is that out from outside of our world comes the wisdom. The Torah starts where we stop, where we can't see anymore, where we can't understand. The Torah is coming in to help us. So what do we do? We have to expand our circle. We have to want to expand our circle. This is the famous thing, Alpi Kabbalah. What is this line? <laughs> what is a line? This line looks like a line, right? No, it's not a line. It's a piece of a very big circle. In other words, if you expand the circle bigger and bigger and bigger, what happens? If you expand the circle to the end, it becomes a line. And that's what we need to do. We need to put the effort in to expand our minds and to expand our consciousness. And if we can get to levels beyond ourselves, beyond our senses, beyond our sense perception. And this is what the Rambam says. He says, it's a mitzvah to place the Hanukkah lamp on the outside of the entrance to one's home, within the handbreadth that's closer to the doorway on the left-hand side, one enters the home, so that the mezuzah will be on the right side and the Hanukkah lamp will be on the left side. Well, it happens to be the door is square. The menorah also is put on the side of the door, on a square door, to remind us that the light that's coming from the menorah is coming from another world, from another level of reality. The light that's coming from the menorah is coming from Hashem. And that's where the Torah is coming from. And that's why the Rambam says, the mitzvah of candling lamps is very dear. Lashin chaviv. Lashin chaviv. This lashin is not used by other mitzvahs. Chaviv means dear. Very dear. A person should be very careful in his observance to publicize the miracle and increase his praise to Hashem. Even if a person has no resources except for food, and what he receives from charity, he should point or sell his garments and purchase oil lamps to kindle them in fulfillment of this mitzvah. How can it be? How can it be such an important mitzvah? A mitzvah that comes from the rabbis? The answer is yes, chavi. Because we know the Lushen chavi is by the Lushen of the Rabbanin. The rabbis of the, mitz the mitzvahs that the rabbis give, give are called chavi. Why chavi? Because if, if we make it dear, it's a question of a value system. If we have the proper value for this mitzvah, this mitzvah of Hanukkah, we will be able to acquire new levels of consciousness. Not only that, but on, the Rambam brings down, on each and every one of these eight days, the entire Hallel is recited. Hallel is recited, the entire Hallel. Usually, only on Sukkot is Hallel is recited. On Pesach, the first day of Pesach it's recited, but after that, no. It's recited, but only half the hollow, not the, not the full hollow. Why is the full hollow recited? Because Hanukkah has such a power, such a cock, to be able to uplift us, to be able to give us a new consciousness, a new awareness of Hashem in the mitzvahs and the Torah. Because of that, so hollow is recited. Not only that, we know that, Rosh, that the din on Rosh Hashanah, Chazal tells us, Depends when the din ends, Hashanah Rabbah, Yom Kippur. Some people say Hanukkah. Why Hanukkah? Because Hanukkah is another chance to access your subconscious. Hanukkah is another chance to take the Torah and the mitzvahs and give them value to the point that they become you. This is what's supposed to happen on Hanukkah. On Hanukkah, the Torah and the mitzvahs and a moon of faith in Hashem is supposed to enter your kishkas. It's supposed to become you. And not only that, every Hanukkah always follows the Parshish Mikkei, Lama, because of the dreams 
It's an ability to enter into another, another level of consciousness. So I want to speak about another subject where Moshe Shapiro, Moshe Shapiro spoke about, and this also relates to the same line of thinking. We know that Chazal tells us that the Greeks forced the Jews to translate the Torah into Greek. And when that happened, what? There were three days of darkness. Three days of darkness. It never happened before. What was so bad? What's the big deal? They translate the Torah into Greek. So what, uh, is it such a horrible thing? It's, it's, it's destruction. It's the end of the world. Why? So Moshe Shapiro brought Rav Shimon Bar Yechai and the Gemara in Brachos, who Yushami in Brachos, it says like this. Rav Shimon Bar Yechai said, had I been a Harsinai, I would have requested two mouths, one for the Torah and one for everything else in the world. What is he saying? What is he saying there? He's, what is he saying? What he's saying is the Torah is a completely different Bria. It's a different creation. It out, comes from outside of our world, outside of the circle. It comes from outer space. It comes from Hashem. It comes from something totally different to the point where Shem Baruchai said, if I would have been a Sinai, I would have asked for two mouths. How can I speak with one mouth, divrei chol, things of this world, and speak with the same mouth, divrei Torah, of holiness, um, of, of kedusha, of tahara, purity, levels of spirituality. How can I speak with the same mouth? And that's why the Ravid says, the question is, Machlokis, the Ravid and the Rambam, in Kriyachma, Halachas Kriyachma. What if a person doesn't know Hebrew and he wants to say Kriyachma? Should he be medaktek just the same way you are in Hebrew? In Hebrew, you're supposed to read every word exactly the way it is. The question is, if you're not going to read it in, in French or English, do you also have to read it exactly, be exactly in every word? So the Roman says yes, but the rabbit says no. What does he say? Who could be meticulous with regards to commentary? What's the point? <laughs> what are we trying to say? We're trying to say, he's, what is he saying? He's saying there's no point to be meticulous in the Shema because the Shema itself, the words of the Torah that are, are the Shema, that is the thing itself where a, comment, where, where a different language is only representation of the thing. What's the point of being meticulous when it comes to representation? He also a different world. The two worlds never touch. The Torah and the Hebrew language is one thing, and this is just a commentary, so it doesn't make any, it doesn't make any sense to be meticulous when you read it. There's no point. But the Greeks, when they translated the Torah, they wanted to say, nah, come on, it's just another safe or just another book like any other book. They wanted to blur this distinction between the Jews and all the nations. Listen, you're like us. We're the same. Everybody's the same. What do you mean? What's so special about your Torah? That's why it was considered darkness. It was considered darkness because when you translated the Torah into, into, other, into another language, you brought it down to the level of everything else. What's the difference in this philosophy and that philosophy? I have Buddhism and I have Judaism and I have Christianity. They're all the same. That's why there were three days of darkness. But what happened? Just the opposite happened. Thank God. This was one of the miracles of Hanukkah. What happened was on Hanukkah, we accepted the oral Torah. The Mogen Avram explains, just like on Shavuos, we accepted the written Torah. On Hanukkah, we accepted the oral Torah. What does that mean? In other words, the Jews, when it was translated, instead of allowing the Torah to go down a level, they used that translation to bring it up a level. Because when you have it, there is a certain advantage. If, uh, I know by Israelis, they read the Torah. So they're reading the Torah in the exact same language they speak. So there's no translation. There's no targum. But when you're an American, you read the Torah, so you translate it into English. So the translation process, you bring out more light. You bring out chedushim. You bring out new things. So that's what happens. It's because the Jews valued the Torah so much that even though it was translated, through the, even though they, 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 they valued it so much, they brought out more light than the depth of the Torah. The translation itself worked against the Greeks. It made it that they understood the Torah even better. It's the same kind of idea. The Torah comes from another world. It comes from a different place. Its translation was a disaster in the sense that you can't bring down from one system to another system. And they wanted to bring the, system, the systems together. But the Torah is a completely different system outside of our world. I want to explain another thing about the Greeks. It says the Greeks we know, they were into beauty. And they were into art. And they were into culture. And they were into sports. Why is that? 
because they want it to divert everyone to think that this world and the beauty of this world and the culture of this world and, and all of its, and all of its glory and Okinami is the thing. This is it. This is the height of what it means to be a human being. And really, it's just the opposite. We know that the real beauty comes from outside of this world. The Torah tells us to be sneeze, to be modest. That's real beauty. We know that all these different things that are taking away our attention is just a way to divert us away from mitzvahs, away from learning. Now, in a certain sense, the more light something is in, in this world, the darker it is, because this is the light. This is what we're talking about, Bore uh, Morea Esh, consuming fire. And the consuming fire is actually darkness. So it comes out that the light of this world and the beauty of this world, even though it's beautiful, we don't say no. And you go to Switzerland, you see the Alps, and you see everything in Okinami. And it can give you tremendous awe of Hashem. The Rome says if you travel the world, it's something that gives you, uh, it gives you fear of God. And, but don't think this is it. That's the point. Don't think this is it. It's just a diversion. Really, you can't be vacationing all day, and you can't be running after all the different things of this world. We have to be doing mitzvahs and learning Torah. Because really, we have to understand that everything is, the real truth is that our obligation comes from outside this world. And that is exactly what the Messiah Sisharim says. The Messiah Sisharim says like this. He's speaking in chapter one. The foundation of true purity and the root of perfect service to Hashem is formed by a person clarifying and verifying himself. What is my obligation in the world? And towards what goal should he direct his outlook and his ambition and everything that he strives for all the days of his life. In other words, a Jew has to ask himself this question. What is my obligation in this world? If you do not believe that there is something beyond this world, so why, why do you even ask yourself that question? Who cares? What's going on? I'm having a good time. That's my obli well, ob obligation. The Greek will say, what do you mean obligation in this world? Okay, so be a nice person, take care of your kids, make some money. What is my obligation? That's, that's, to be my, that's the root of perfection. That's the root of perfection? No, I'm here to have a good time. And then after 120 years, it's over. And there's nothing beyond my senses. And there's nothing in my subconscious. And there's nothing deeper. Everything is on the surface level. So why would I possibly ask, what's my obligation? And what is my goal? I'm going to be asking at the same level. What is my goal for this world? No, it has to be totally beyond. This is our goal. Our goal is the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is to serve Hashem and to bring God into our lives. And that has to do with Messias Nefesh. This is also the Ramchal, with Messias Nefesh. We know that Torah Shabbat Pei, when the Jews accept the Torah, uh, Torah Shabbat Pei, the oral law upon themselves, we know it's hard work. That's what it talks about, the chavivas of the mitzvahs. It has to be dear. You have to care. You have to love. You have to want. You have to be a Whatever you used to say, you have to become a mavakesh. You have to be one who desires. Look what it says, the Ramchal. It's obvious that even a person carefully monitors himself. He is not in the power to save himself unless Hashem helps him. Why? His Sahara, his evil inclination, our desires to do bad, our desires are our body, our desire to do the wrong thing is extremely powerful. Like the Pusik says, the wicked one lies and waits, uh, waits for the righteous one. However, this does not absolve him from the obligation of self-analysis. If a person monitors himself so he shouldn't fall into sin, then the Holy One blessed be to helps him. But if he doesn't monitor himself, then Hashem's not going to help him. There's no way. So the point is that we have to want, we have to care, we have to desire, we have to strive, we have to work, we have to really want to come close to Hashem. So I want to bring one last point here. This could be, it's a possibility that this could be Peshat here in the dreidel. Look at the dreidel. The dreidel is square, actually. It has four sides. We put a, a nun and a hay and a gimel and a pay on each side. And we spin the dreidel from on top. And we spin the square dreidel, which is a square, which we talked about the square is from beyond this world. And what happens when we spin it? Well, what happens is... Uh, it's a circle. We look at it, we see that it's a circle. It starts out as a square and it becomes a circle. This is the concept. But maybe it's my own Peshat. 
this is coming from that. The square is coming into the circle. That's what Hanukkah is about. This symbol here. We have to bring the light of Hanukkah from the square, from the door, from outside of our house and bring it into our house, into our lives, that it will change us and that we can grow and it will give us tremendous simcha also. When I, I, Hanukkah is about amuna, faith. We have faith. We understand we're not alone. It's true, if you would think about it for a moment, you would say, well, wait a second, the world is spinning at 100,000 miles an hour. Who's this not going to crash? And if, see, as, as soon as you start to expand your circle, and you start to become conscious of where you are and who you are and what you are. We don't even understand what's going on inside of our blood. Our blood's moving extremely fast. We, uh, what's going on? Germs, molecules, and cells. The world's spinning at 100,000 miles an hour, going around and around. And we think, everything's fine. You know, I'm just thinking about my little doll and almost I'm stuck in my little circle. But as soon as we start to expand, so our mind expands. So then at that point, we have to have a moon and we have to realize there's Bore Olam. There's a master of the universe. And he is outside of our world. And in Hanukkah, we can get a glimpse of the master of the universe and the Torah and the mitzvahs. And everyone should have a great Hanukkah. Thank you for listening. To get more enthusiasm for your Judaism, become a free member at GlobalYeshiva.com.